Today's video is part one of the Rascals, who really gave credibility to the Blue Eyed Soul style of the mid-60s. And like any other band, they had a bumpy ride during the decade. So in this video, we're going to look at their history and listen to some of their music here on Pop Goes the 60s. The dance craze The Twist was popularized in New York's Peppermint Lounge in the early 60s. And the band that helped get it there was Joey D and the Starlighters. And they had a number one song called Peppermint Twist, and that helped put this club on the map. And celebrities from all over came to go to this club. Eventually, Joey D opened up his own club, The Starlighter, and reformed his band, and he got some new guys in. One guy was a classically trained pianist named Felix Cavalieri. Another guy was a guitar player named Gene Cornish from the band called The Unbeatables. And the third guy was a singer named Eddie Brigatti, whose older brother David was a former lead vocalist in The Starlighters. So the new Starlighters didn't last too long with this configuration. Uh, the money wasn't coming in and uh, Gene, Felix, and Eddie were getting a little bit disgruntled and they aired their grievances in a band meeting in which they ended up all walking out. I mean, Joey D wasn't expecting this apparently and he chased out after them saying, oh, you'll never work in New York again. So it was one of those kind of meetings. So that was the impetus for them to start a new band. So the band started with Gene Cornish, a guitarist, who was originally born in Ottawa but was raised in Rochester, New York. Felix Cavalieri was from the Pelham area of the Bronx, and he was a dropout from Syracuse. And Eddie Brigatti was from Garfield, New Jersey, and he obviously knew about this gig from his brother David. Now Felix knew of one drummer that he knew had to be in the band, and that was a guy named Dino Dinelli. And he was from Jersey City, New Jersey. And he was kind of a quiet guy, and he had played at a jazz club and hung around at this place called the Metropole, and had learned from some pretty heavy hitters there. So when he was brought into the band, uh, Gene didn't know him. Uh, Eddie knew him maybe slightly, and Gene said in his biography that I saw this little tiny drum kit. I was like, how is he going to make any sound out of that? But he could make some great sounds, and he was a fantastic drummer and came with quite a lot of uh, live experience and really set up the perfect backbeat for this band. Now, Felix had a few connections of his own, and he lined up a gig before these guys even played a note together. And this was in Lodi, New Jersey at the Choo Choo Club, and they started to rehearse immediately. Now, they began to gel pretty quick, and they had a really good sound, and these guys had all been playing, so it wasn't like they were rusty at all, and they had a lot of confidence. So they had to, to come up with a look for themselves, and Eddie came in, he saw these, these knickers, and he wore them to a rehearsal one day and as if they, if they were the most normal thing and everybody was laughing at him. So he said, hey, these are only a buck a piece. So they started to add different things. Dino added a short tie and the band cobbled up this little Lord Fauntleroy outfit that they, they, they used because it was easy to, to dance in. They were easy to clean because they were so cheap. And this was a different look. Now the name The Rascals came from Dino. He was up late watching uh, The Little Rascals television show, the old 30s uh, movies. He really loved that name, but the other band members didn't go for it. So what he did is he started leaving little notes around all over with the name Rascals on it. And eventually they just got used to it and they just really loved the name. So after they got the name nailed down, they had started to play at the Choo Choo Club and they started packing them in after a few weeks. Felix, Dino and Gene rented an apartment nearby and Eddie lived at home in New Jersey still at this time. And during their residency there, their short resi residency, uh, Eddie had a real bad car accident and the driver in the car he was in actually was killed in this accident and Eddie was in, the, in a coma. So this halted the band temporarily. Uh, the band actually got another gig lined up at a new place in the Hamptons called The Barge and the band started to play again as a trio until Eddie recuperated. Now the gig that they secured in the Hamptons was a really excellent, excellent gig for them because it's where the rich people go to play. So there were record producers and there was people of note coming through there. And this place called The Barge was just about to open and the Rascals got to even help design the stage a little bit. 
and they were the house band right from the get-go and they started really packing people in and people started dancing and having a lot of fun to their high energy music. Now Eddie came out of the coma and they really took it, he took his time coming back. He was in, in rough shape, he had a punctured lung and he, he joined the band slowly and, and only played a few songs at a time with the band but eventually he got strong again and they were back to being a full-time four-piece. Now the problem with the Hamptons in this barge at night, there was more of a, it was an adult, an adult crowd, but the Rascals really appealed to the kids, the younger teenagers. So they designed uh, an afternoon show that was alcohol free, and that packed the kids in, in the day and the adults at night. Now some of the songs they were performing during this time was Good Lovin', that had been a song by a group called The Olympics. They were doing Beatle covers like You Can't Do That and No Reply. And they were doing uh, R&B covers and, and giving them a, a jolt of energy because people were dancing to them. And the band gelled, they had this great gig, it was always packed. This place only hold, held about 100 people but a great intimate place. And as the band gelled, the guys got tight with one another. The buzz grew and they started getting courted by record companies. So the first few that came by were Capital, Columbia, and Kama Sutra. Now an interesting story is that Phil Spector caught wind of them as well. He came all the way, flew from Los Angeles, and then drove up to the Hamptons. When Spector asked to produce them, the band kind of met his proposal with silence. And the band, they wanted to produce themselves. And they told them that. I don't know if they were just naive or I'm not sure what they were thinking, but they had a very strong sense of who they were and wanted to produce themselves. And Spectre basically said, well, you know what you just did, don't you? And uh, I guess they did. And anyway, Spectre left in somewhat of a huff after coming all that way. And then the band heard an ambulance come shortly after because I guess Spectre was so angry he kicked a fire hydrant and broke his foot. <laughs> so that I thought was hilarious. I could almost do a video on the bands that turned Spectre down. I think I got four bands on the list so far anyway. So now that they were creating a buzz, they had to get some management. And they signed two guys. They signed Sid Bernstein and Walter Hyman. And uh, the record companies now went through them. And one of the other record companies that threw their hat in the ring was Atlantic. And Atlantic, they were looking to get into rock and roll, and they typically, they had a lot of black acts. In fact, it was, it was all pretty much an all-black label. And Atlantic offered $10,000 less than some of the other labels, or the other record companies. And what the Rascals negotiated for themselves is the ability to produce themselves and to choose the material for singles. So they took less money up front to get more creative control and Atlantic went for it. And they were indeed the first white act to be signed to Atlantic. Now one of the other things that they benefited from in moving to Atlantic, uh, first of all, the Erdogan brothers really liked the Rascals, and the Rascals also, uh, they retained their publishing. So that, that was huge. In the 60s, many bands were not able to secure that, but Atlantic uh, worked with them enough and liked them enough and had enough faith in them, I guess, to let that go. So their next gig was in Manhattan. Uh, it was the phone booth on East 55th Street. And at this time, they, they started to get, there's a buzz in, the, in, in New York, and people started to come to see them. Now, at this point, they're looking for songs. And the songs that Atlantic had from some of their songwriters weren't suitable for the band. The band weren't really writing much yet. But they did get one song that came their way from the songwriting team of Lori Burton and Pam Sawyer called I Ain't Gonna Eat My Heart Out Anymore. <laughs> This song was chosen as their first single. It's just a great song. It's got a great vocal delivery. Gene Cornish plays a great solo. He also plays bass on this track. And Felix on the Hammond organ is that mighty Hammond has got that great whine on there. And of course, Dino is laying down the perfect beat. Now one thing happened here also when they released the single, the, the record label Atlantic took it upon themselves to change the Rascals name. There was another group called the Harmonica Rascals, and they supposedly threatened a lawsuit against Atlantic. I don't know who this little band was, but uh, instead of fighting it, uh, the, the label just called them the Young Rascals without the band's approval. So that was, that was a sticking point, but they had the record contract, they had the, the single that they were gonna release, and with this connection to Sid Bernstein, he was the one that helped bring the Beatles to Shea Stadium. The Rascals were at Shea Stadium to witness the event. They did not play, as some sources quote, but they actually were there 
and got to see the band play. Another one of Sid Bernstein's talents was booking for television. So he started booking the Rascals on TV shows. They almost always sang live on television. They very rarely did lip syncing. They really hated to do that. I Ain't Gonna Eat My Heart Out Anymore broke in the Northeast and soon it broke nationwide. It only got to number 52, but it started to open some doors for the Rascals. So their next residency was at the Whiskey A Go-Go in Hollywood, and a host of celebrities showed up to see them, and they even the doors even opened for them. This is before the doors had a recording contract. So they did a bunch of television so shows out there too, is, you know, American Bandstand, where the action is, and they started to really get a good following and some street cred out on the West Coast. The way the Rascals recorded in the studio, they had some very good engineers that I think essentially helped with the production, though the Rascals kind of had final say on the song and, and the treatment of the song. Tom Dowd was one of the engineers that worked with them closely, and he, he made the very good decision to go out and see them and see their live show. So he made a list of the songs that they played live, because he was looking for the next single. And I had mentioned earlier that a group called the Olympics had done a song called Good Lovin'. Well, the Rascals version of that, the way they did it, was super high energy and the, the crowd really loved it. They danced and that was a real showstopper for them. So he suggested that they do that as their next single. One, two, three. Good love. Good Lovin' was released in February of 1966, and one of the things that Atlantic wanted to do was not put their picture on the picture sleeve of the single because they felt that R&B stations wouldn't play it because the band was white. I think they, would, they thought, some people thought they were, they were a black band. So they got past that. They did have a picture sleeve with their actual picture on it. And as they started to record tracks for the first album, they picked another Lori Burton and Pam Sawyer song called Baby Let's Wait. And they did a really fine original called Do You Feel It? Now those songs are great, but some of their cover songs are really what gave them a very strong reputation. I'm gonna wait till the midnight hour. my love. So the Mustang salad baby. Thank you, So this is their first album. It's called The Young Rascals, featuring Good Lovin'. And the next song, you just heard Mustang Sally in the Midnight Hour. Uh, just, they're almost like, they're, they're standards, really, both of those songs. And the Rascals helped bring those, uh, to get them more radio airplay, even though they were not singles by the Rascals. So the next two singles were two originals. One's called You Better Run and Come On Up. All right, I'd like to do a quick rundown of the Rascals' instrumentation. So Gene Cornish, the guitar player, now he had to carry a lot of sound. He was the only guitarist in the band. They didn't have a bassist live. Uh, Gene's guitar style was real dirty and gritty and sexy, and it blended really well with Dino's crisp, clean drumming. Dinelli was considered, I consider him, the Gene Krupa of 60s rock drumming. And the, ba the, the foundation of the band was really those two guys. Now Felix, on the other hand, he played the mighty Hammond organ, and though that was a somewhat popular instrument, he played it with a lot of soul, and he used the bass pedals underneath to give the bass, uh, in lieu of having a bass guitar live. And finally we have Eddie Brigatti's great vocals, his soulful vocals. Uh, his brother David would occasionally help out singing in the studio, and to get that dual, those dual brothers voices on backing vocals was really a special sound. And David also helped with some of the arrangements of some of the vocals. The next single started a string of self pen hits, and this one's called Lonely Too Long. So the next album is called Collections, and the lead single, as I mentioned, is called Lonely Too Long. They started doing a lot of writing here on this album, but some of their covers are also very strong. Since I fell 
for you. Alongside these great covers are some fine originals, one being What is the Reason, another one by Gene Cornish called 1956, and Love is a Beautiful Thing. Now, as you can hear, that last song, Love is a Beautiful Thing, picks up on that hippie vibe a little bit that they'll be delving into a little bit later in their career, not long after this album, actually. Now, during this album, as the band continued to get tight together, Eddie Brigatti and uh, Felix Cavalieri, they developed a very good writing partnership together, while Dino and Gene formed a tight musical bond together. Now, at this time, they were starting to do shows for uh, uh, some Murray the K packages, and this is where you had multiple bands playing throughout the day and um, on these, these bus tours and everything. And on this Murray the K uh, show, these shows that they had a short residency at, the white audiences seemed to really respond well to the band. But for some reason in the evening, the black audiences were kind of ho-hum and they figured out that, well, maybe it's these outfits that we're wearing. And <laughs> for, the black, for the, the black shows, they went and did the regular dress and they had an immediate reaction from the black crowd that was more positive. So they started to uh, move away from the knickers a little bit and go to just regular street clothing. So they started having enough hits where they could do a proper tour of Europe. And it was a short tour, and they were dipping their toe in a little bit. And in London, they did a show at the Scotch, uh, Scotch of St. James Club. And this was kind of a funny story because Dino, his set was set up, but the bass drum was not nailed down to the floor. So the bass drum kept moving and he was getting flustered. So one of the people, a lot of celebrities came to see him and Keith Moon jumped up on the stage and held his drum for the entire set. So that's how these drummers kind of hang together, I guess, and have that camaraderie. And in turn, Dino taught him how to twirl the sticks. The Rascals returned home to the U.S. in early 1967 and they realized things were starting to change rapidly. And we're going to ride the wave of 1967 in part two of The Rascals here on Pop Goes the 60s. Wait, wait. 